Thanks, Levi. You know, let's just pray for our community and our valley right now. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to live in this hour. Father, I, I, I don't care what the world's saying right now. God, I don't care what all the other voices are saying out there. Jesus, you are still building your church, Amen. and the gates of hell will not prevail. Thank you, Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord, that the church of the living God doesn't stop because others stop. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and you have a purpose, and God, you are orchestrating one of the greatest harvests that we've ever seen. Yes. I thank you for that. Thank you for moving on people's hearts all through our valley. Father, we thank you for receptive hearts for this hour, God, and for, for what you're doing. Lord, we pray that you would reveal yourself during this time, God. We pray, Father, that, that, that Lord, you would show who you are. And God, from that goodness, from that glory, that you would be seen in the right way. And that people's hearts would go towards you. God, I, I pray, Father, that there might be somebody obviously out there, uh, Lord, that might be going wrong direction today, God. And I pray that you would divinely arrest them, God. Yes. Divinely, Father, show them the way. Head them in the right direction, God. I pray that decisions would be made over and over and over towards Christ. Lord, we're believing for our valley, not just a smidgen, not just a few here and there. God, we're believing for a, uh, a community-wide harvest yes. in our valley. You, You've placed us here for such a time as this. And God, we just thank you for your goodness and your blessing. And Father, for the favor of God that's on people's lives this morning. Thank you for that. For the favor of God. Lord, you have chosen us. Lord, you have hand selected us from the beginning of time. Lord, we are purpose driven and presence driven today. God, in the things of you. And so, Father, I pray that you would empower your people. Help them to know that, God, they're equipped for every battle that comes their way. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Man, glad you came to church today. All right. Glad you're here on this Labor Day weekend. Yeah. Lots of people off camping and stuff, and that's okay. Because you need that rest time, you need that downtime. But you also need this time. Yeah, so important. That we're getting God's word. Amen. And that we're under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That we're under where that flow is to humanity. Okay, so we left off in John chapter 11 last week and we were talking about one of the greatest miracles uh, that, that happened in Jesus' ministry uh, was Lazarus being raised from the dead. And uh, it was a tremendous miracle. And word got out when this man came back to life four days in the grave. 
But the grave could not hold him <laughs> because Jesus was speaking life into his life. And uh, he does that with us. How many of you know every day? Yes. He speaks life into our life, our, our short existence yes. that we have on this earth. And, and he meets with us. So we left off last week with Lazarus being raised from the dead. So, and, and as I said, the news of this miracle just spread like wildfire. The high priest and the religious leaders were perplexed and they're enraged with the whole situation with Jesus. His name was getting out there. There's a new rabbi in town. And he's doing incredible things for the kingdom of God. But they decided through the high priest's prophetic statement that he should die for the good of the nation. Chapter this one man should die for the good of the nation. The enemy thought that he was in control of Jesus' life or death. But God was allowing things to take place for the greatest victory of all time. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do we see it as defeat today or do we see it as victory? No matter what our mind says today, and you have to see your life like that. No matter what it looks like around you, you have got to see that God's got a plan and that he's going to meet you right where you're at. And no matter what it looks like today, look at the words that he's spoken to you. Amen? Amen. Look what he's saying in our time. Jesus hasn't stopped. God the Father hasn't stopped today. There, he's still flowing in humanity. Until the fat lady sings, it's not over, right? I don't know if that's PC or not. But <laughs> just a saying. Just a saying. <laughs> so we come to John chapter 12 here. <clears throat> Jesus is now on the home stretch with his life and purpose on earth. This is kind of the beginning of the end here. The last stretch. The religious leaders will stop at nothing to kill Jesus at this point and make him an example to all the people. But Jesus never stopped being in the perfect rhythm that God the Father had for him. You ever feel like you're out of rhythm? That there's a little thump to your life and you don't know what's going on? When your car is out of alignment, how many of you know there's a little thump? <laughs> But when you're in alignment and in right standing with him, no matter what it looks like, how many of you know there's no thump? God will even out what needs to be even. He will remove every obstacle that is trying to thwart the purposes of God for your life. Anybody with me this morning? Yes. Amen. Yes. The normal Jewish people who have heard of him raising Lazarus from the dead are now convinced that this man is the Messiah. There were it, it, both sides of the fence here. Some just did not believe. And I, I'd love to say that, that most believed, but just some believed and were convinced. And they wanted to see this man, Jesus. John chapter 12. Let's dive in to the scriptures and recognize that God's word is alive. It's full of power. It's operative. It's energizing to us today. It helps us to bring structure in our life. How many of you know the word of God supersedes what you're looking at today? Amen. <clears throat> okay. Verse one says this. Six days before the Passover celebration began, when Jesus was about to give his life, at Passover. Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus. The Bible says a dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served. Lazarus was among those who ate with them. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. 
The Bible says the house was filled. Everybody say filled. Filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, excuse me, filled with the fragrance, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. How many of you know you're always going to have people around you that have zero character? Like, it's just not there. Even though they've been given every opportunity, all the, they've heard all the teaching, but they just don't go God's direction. Judas was one. Judas replied, or Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So before all the Passover time starts for the Jewish people during this time, Jesus spends time with the ones who are closest to him. He spends time with his disciples in in very intimate settings in the garden, in the Passover meal, just spending time with them. Just just saying, I've got to go, but it's going to be okay. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus want to honor him with a special dinner. Remember that their hearts had been impacted in a way that Jesus went from being just a friend to Yeshua, the the chosen God-man. In honor of him, Mary begins to wash his feet, which is the Jewish custom in most Jewish households when a guest arrives. Usually it's the servant. They have a servant in there, and the servant does that. Or they have a little wash basin. The person can do it for himself. But Mary chose to wash the feet of Jesus. Mary's heart was way different than a normal servant in this act that she performed. How many of you know she gets it? She gets who he is. Some people confuse Mary of Bethany with with Mary of Galilee, the woman of ill repute. There's a there's a few things that are you know similar. They both washed the feet of Jesus and wiped it with her hair. Um, they both had. Um, Things that, like a perfume, expensive nard, the Bible says here with, um, and, and, and that was like an anointing balm that was mixed with fragrance. And Mary of Galilee, uh, it didn't say the ointment that she had. One was at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany, and the other one was at Simon the Pharisee's house. Remember that? That was another Mary. Mary, uh, as I said, one was from Galilee, one was from Bethany. One offended Judas Iscariot, this Mary that we're talking about today. The other one offended Simon the Pharisee, who wouldn't even let uh, a sinful woman touch him. One was at the end of Jesus' ministry, and that's what we're talking about today, and one was at the start of Jesus' ministry. Just like we have in society, we have lots of Michaels, we have lots of Joes, we have lots of Sams. There were lots of Marys during this time. And let's not confuse them um, today. The Mary of Bethany that we're talking about today was in preparation for his burial. The Mary of Galilee was at at the start of Jesus' ministry as an illustration of Jesus' ability to forgive sins. So Mary was worshiping Jesus as the chosen Son of God who was to take away the sins of the world. In this simple but profound act, she displays an act of worship to Jesus. How many of you know he's worthy of all that worship? 
he's worthy, and she recognized. She wanted to be, let me say this the right way, and don't get the wrong intentions here, because there have been, in the world, people have tried to define Mary's relationship with Jesus in a, in a, uh, a perverted way. But how many of you know it wasn't that? She worshipped him as God. And in the purest sense, she wanted to be as close to Jesus as possible. I want to just stop here just for a second and just say this. Not in any way to bring shame, but to bring challenge to your life. How long has it been for each of us where we have given Jesus worship like this? We come in here and we sing songs, and that's awesome. And we, how many of you know, praise enforces the victory of Jesus? Amen? And praise is we praise him for what he's done and we praise him for who he is. But worship absolutely 100%. We worship him because of who he is. And how many of you know he's worthy? Amen. He is worthy. I believe in this hour that there needs to be that people need to embrace the fear of the Lord. There's lots of things happening on the face of the earth. You won't really fear God. And what is fearing God? Is that being afraid of him? No, that is honoring him. That is recognizing who he is. That is getting on your knees when, when you feel that beckoning from the Lord and that, that thing on the inside. I don't know about you, but every once in a while, I just feel like I'm supposed to kneel before him. And my devotion's in the morning. I just, and if I don't, I realize the lack of being submitted to a God who loves me and has poured it out for me. And you say, that just sounds religious. You don't understand. He is everything. We are nothing without him. Think of where you were when you came to Christ and your mindset and your heart and all the selfishness on the inside. Mary got it. She's not better than anybody else. She just chose to press in. She she chose to push through all of the muck and the mire. She knew what she was before he came into their life. There's a few things that I want you to look at in, in this act of worship. In this simple but profound act, she displays worship, true, pure worship before the Lord. She displays humility. What is humility? Recognizing that we need God in every facet of our life. We do. Mankind has a great need for God. And so she wipes his feet with her hair and she did it. How many of you know she was bold? (laughs) I'm going to get as close to him as possible and honor him for who he is. The second thing, she had humility, but she gave her best. You know, some of us, and I tell on myself sometimes, I try to spend the time with the Lord every day Every morning, I try to spend time with the Lord. 
But what about in those times where I feel like I need to go in and I don't? When he's saying, hey, he's not just a, a friend. How many of you know he's the king of kings? He's our Lord. And he said, and he's our lover. And he says, come away with me. Come away with me. Be with me. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you let me take that. She gave her best for that day and worship. And how many of you know that worship is sacrificial? It costs you something. You have to push back all of the stuff that would hinder you from going in. How many of you know there's a lot of stuff out there? There's a lot of distractions. But what's the most important thing? Everybody say, Mary got it. She got it. Worship is sacrificial in the Old Testament. How many of you know that it was work when they would sacrifice those animals and put them on the altar? It was bloody. But he's worth it. Amen. It costs you something. This expensive perfume that she had worked for. Somebody worked for this. And she put it on his feet. And she put it on probably uh, parts of his body. And she doesn't withhold And it's extravagant because this stuff, the fragrance filled the whole house. Another thing is she displayed a true worshiper's heart because she was worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, reality. She wasn't destitute or in desperate times like another woman who did a similar act and we were talking about her, the Mary from Galilee. She was in desperate. She needed a savior. She needed saving. And she was asking for forgiveness, basically, and and coming in and just wanting to be close to Jesus. And he didn't push her aside. He brought her in. But Mary didn't have a lot of things to be worried about. Her brother had just gotten healed and came back to life. Life was good. And in the midst of that, you know, sometimes we feel like that we have to be desperate to really worship God like this. And how many of you know you don't have to be? You can be drawn by God's love into a place like this. Recognizing who he is. She didn't have any motives of receiving something from Christ when she did this act of worship. She did it just because she recognized who he was. And Jesus said, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. Judas, in other words, Judas, shut up. I don't care what you think. You might think that. But she is in a Kairos moment right now. She is in a moment, an opportunity when it comes to the things of God. And how many of you know this was memorialized here in the scriptures? 
Mary was one of the few that believed Jesus' words of giving his life for humanity. She honored his sacrifice of life by this act of worship. It was possible that the fragrance she poured, now listen to this, and I want, I want this to explode in your mentality. It's one thing for Jesus to say, she did this in preparation for my burial. It's another thing to think of it like this. It was possible that the fragrance she poured on him stayed with Jesus all the way to his crucifixion. As they were whipping him on his back and beating him and punching him in the face and pulling at his beard. And when they led him down the road, with the cross on his back, that fragrance that this woman pours on him. Could be smell this act of worship. I want you guys to have such a hunger and such a thirst to press in past all the barriers that try and stop you on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis from coming in and knowing God in a greater way. Anybody with me this morning? Amen. Let's go on. John 12, 9. When all the people heard of Jesus, I mean, how many of you know we could camp there for long periods of time where we need to get through John someday? When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse 10 says, Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. They were praising him and, and the weird thing about it was they didn't even know what they were praising. Because many of the people during that time thought that the Messiah would come in and take rulership and take rulership over the Romans, release them from the Roman rule that was going on during that time. And they wanted us, they thought that the Messiah was going to set up his kingship and have an earthly king on the face of the earth. And he would provide, he multiplied the loaves and the fish, so he would supply all the food, all the protection, all of the stuff on the face of the earth. And they were saying, praise to the one. How many of you know it wasn't the earthly kingdom, it's the spiritual kingdom that he was setting up? This was a wonderful and significant scene to behold. The people had heard of the miracles and the teaching of this gifted rabbi, but now they get to see him firsthand. And so they are praising him, which is totally apropos. That's, that's fine that they're praising him, even though that they don't really know who he is. How many of you know when we first start out in our Christianity, we really don't know who Jesus is. But we've accepted him and we've embraced him as, as king in our lives and Lord of our lives. But we don't really understand a whole lot. Some, were, some that were in the crowd were at the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. But here all these people were converging into the holy city, Jerusalem, with each one. Now listen to this. Each one were bringing their lamb for the sacrifice for Passover. And so there's all these little lambs in the midst of the people. 
Josephus, the historian, said that there were an estimated 256,000 lambs being led to the temple to be sacrificed. So get the picture. So they're... So the crowd with their lambs were looking to and praising Jesus, the ultimate lamb who takes away the sins of the world, even without necessarily knowing. They didn't necessarily see that perspective, but they were looking to Jesus. They were looking to Jesus, even though he wasn't a political or national savior that they thought but he was about to pay the price for all of humanity. They were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This large, enthusiastic crowd greeted Jesus with the words from the Messianic Psalm, uh, Psalm 118, 25 and 26. The cry Hosanna meant, save us now, save us now. And on this day, the crowd received Jesus as a triumphant Messiah. Let's go on. So Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. The commentator Morris said this, the donkey was not normally used by a warlike person. It was the animal of a man of peace, It was like a priest would come in on this animal or merchant or somebody that was more humble. Might also be used by a person of importance, but in connection with peaceable purposes. A conqueror would ride into the city on a war horse or perhaps march in on foot at the head of his troops. The donkey speaks of peace. Everybody say peace. It's how he came into the world. How many of you know he came the humble way? He came the right way, being born of a virgin. It wasn't all the fam and and the fanfare out there uh, during his his birth. John chapter 12, verse 16. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after this this coming in on the donkey, but after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. Verse 18 says, that was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign. When the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. They were enraged. They were losing their power. How many of you know if Jesus came on the scene right now, I would lose my job? (laughs) Because I'm not going to stand up here when Jesus could stand up here. Right? And how many of you know that's okay? It's going to benefit us. I would, in a heartbeat, step down to sit at the master's feet. But these people were power hungry. These people were enraged. They wanted to gnash their teeth on Jesus for taking their power, for taking, um, for, for taking their place, in a sense. You know, you can only be somebody's savior for a period of time in somebody's life and leading them and directing them. But there's some point when you have to turn them over to Jesus and say and tell them, you don't need to be hearing me. You need to hear him. Right? You need to hear his words in your life, directing you, taking you to that next step. Amen? Because you're not somebody's savior. Jesus is the savior. He's the one who wants to be their friend, their master, their Lord. And we need to keep that in balance. 
I can only take somebody so far. But when we really start to grow is when we, when we mature enough to, to, to really go, I need to hear God for myself, not what Pastor Mike says. Not, I, I need to hear, amen, you know, keep that in balance. So the disciples, after the fact, noticed that this whole scenario was a fulfillment of prophecy told hundreds of years before. There's an author that wrote the book, uh, Evidence of the Reality, the, excuse me, the Reliability of the Bible. He wrote this, unique among all books ever written, the Bible accurately foretells specific events in detail many years, sometimes centuries before they occur. Roughly 2,500 prophecies appear in the pages of the Bible about 2,000 of which have already been fulfilled to the letter. No errors. We're going to tell your neighbors, say, no errors. And, and, and I'm appealing to a logical crowd right now. Just because sometimes the Bible doesn't make sense to them because it's, it can be touchy-feely or, you know, they're, they're just not faith-based. They're more fact-based. The remaining 500 prophecies reach into the future and may be seen unfolding as days go by. How many of you know there's probably, there is prophecy being fulfilled right now? And we need to look at God's word there and, and recognize he's bringing it to pass. Every word that he's spoken has the power of fulfillment. And at some point you can bank on it, it's going to happen whether it's the way you think it's going to happen or not. Since the probability for any one of these prophecies have been fulfilled by chance averages less than 1 in 10, and that's a figure that's very, very conservative, and since the prophecies are for the most part independent of one another, the odds for all these prophecies, now listen to this, you logical thinkers, the odds for all these prophecies having been fulfilled by chance without error is less than 1 and 10 to the 2,000th power. That is 10 with 2,000 zeros behind it. That these prophecies would ever be fulfilled with no error. I don't even know that's a God that fulfills his, what he says. Right? Where Moses was the lawgiver, Jesus was the law fulfiller. Where the Old Testament had types and shadows of what was to become, Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law and of the scriptures that were spoken about him. We still have prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled, but just looking at what has already been done, we can have full assurance that God will bring everything to pass in his perfect timing. How many of you know we can rest in his faithful arms Amen. and his faithful words? Let's go on. So John 12, 20 says, As some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, they said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. So several days later, after the triumphal entry by Jesus, there were some Greeks. <laughs> they were curious and they were intrigued. They were on the outside looking in, but they said, we, we want to meet Jesus. There's so much stuff going on. We realize the excitement in people's hearts. We recognize that there is something going on and they didn't want to miss out. Could this have been the aha moment for Jesus when Jesus switched in his mind from just the children of Israel to a worldwide net of salvation? Just these Greeks coming up at the last moment. He said it himself. He was called first to the lost sheep of Israel. And here come these curious Greeks wanting to meet with him at the very end of his life. 
Let's go on. Jesus replied, now the time has come. And this is the reply. As soon as these Greeks came and, and Andrew and Philip went to Jesus and said, hey, these guys want to meet with you. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the son of man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it just remains alone until it's planted. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care for nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me. Because my servants must be where I am. Proximity, being close. What did we say about Mary? She just wanted to be close. My servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Jesus spoke this to Jewish disciples as well as these Gentiles. His death would bring the provision of salvation to the world. The death of the kernel of wheat I want you guys to grab a hold of this. The death of the kernel of wheat is the surrendering of a sinless, guiltless life on behalf of a corruptible world. Every seed that falls into the ground and dies has the ability to bring forth a harvest of the same kind. Because seed produces after its own kind. So Jesus was taking sin in his flesh. He was, had to take sin to the cross for corruptible lives. But he was about to sow his life as an incorruptible seed. Peter later says this. We're born again out of the, not the corruptible seed, the incorruptible seed cannot be corrupted. When we accept Christ, we have an incorruptible seed generating life within our spirit and soul and really our whole life. There's a brand new DNA factor that produces heavenly attributes, attitudes, and atmospheres in our life. Just as a seed has the ability to produce 10,000 trees, the seed of Christ has the power to generate life and multiply to whoever will put their trust and faith in him. So Jesus speaks of his death here, but he also addresses the responsibility for each person to lose his or her life in this world to gain and retain the new life in Christ. You know, with Moses and the children of Israel, he brought them out to bring them in. If you never experience the losing of your life and your will and your selfishness and your agendas and all those things that are driven by human corruptibility, If you never leave that, you can never recognize this new incorruptible seed inside of you. You can never come into that. Jesus says that here. He said, you've got to what? Follow me. Follow me. Jesus said in the garden, he said, it's not my will. But Lord, it's your will. He followed the Father in every area of his life. And it brought forth fruit and more fruit. And how many of you know? Much fruit. (laughs) Unless that kernel of wheat dies in the ground. This word follow means to be in the same way. 
you know, it's not just following, just in the sense of just following back behind somebody. It means to be in the same way with, to accompany, especially as a disciple, down a similar road. When we look at adversity and challenges that try to separate us from a God that loves us, circumstances rise up. How much fortitude do you have on the inside? The Bible says when we're at our weakest point, how many of you know he can be strong? Amen? I'm not looking to the fortitude of just a decision that I make. I'm expecting that decision to be an exchange process where I give him my weakness, the worst of the worst thing that I would succumb to a really hard time with junk food. When I go to the store, I have to make sure that I have stocked up with junk food. It's a comfort thing. Some of you in here work in the grocery store, so you know. <laughs> I can bring up my fruit and I can have vegetables, fresh vegetables, and I want you to know that's all for Corolla. <laughs> but then I have my nibs and I have all this stuff. Honey buns lately. Not just honey buns, jumbo honey buns. <laughs> It's just comfort to know that it's there. I don't even have to eat it right away. It's not like I eat it all at once. But just to know that it's there. And I have a weakness. And how many of you know you are what you eat? If, if I just pig out on Doritos and honey buns for the rest of my life. How many of you know I'm going to die quick? <laughs> I have a, I, and I'm, I'm just trying to be open and real. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm, I'm just weak in that area. And as much as I walk past that 10 times, those areas, it just draws me in. But at some point, if I expect to get healthy, right? If I'm going to turn the corner, I've got to turn from that by a decision, go past it, and get to the good stuff. Vegetables. <laughs> Stuff that's going to pump me up. <laughs> Stuff that's going to, that I'll, that I'll feel better with. And we do the same things with sin, don't we? It just, it's that habitual you know, and I got to say, honey buns are much better than potatoes. <laughs> it's better tasting. I, I, get the, I get the comfort right away. <clears throat> but afterwards, if I eat too much of that, I crash. Some people are going, oh my gosh, she's still in my life right now. <laughs> I crash. Same thing with sin. Amen. 
The book of Colossians says you've got to kill and dead the things of the flesh. In other words, you've got to walk past those arenas and keep on walking past those where you almost have a Holy Ghost rut to the good things of God. Not in a bad way, not a bad rut, but a good rut. Where, you know, you try to get out of a rut you, and it just seems to slide back in. See, we've developed ruts to the bad things. And God wants to put you on a new highway of life, let's say. And cause you to come into this new habitual rhythm of the glory of God in your life. I don't want to be way out there with stuff. I just want to know that I can follow Jesus like Jesus followed the Father. He said, I only do what I see him do and I only say the things that he shows me. You guys getting anything this morning? There's a lot more to it than just trudging along going, and Jesus is right here. Be Jesus for me. For a second. <laughs> Where you're just looking at the back of somebody and you're just trudging along and you go, I don't know about this Christian life, but well, yeah, go. <laughs> I don't know. I can't even keep up with it. It is. It's having the same mindset. Philippians says, have this mind that Jesus had. Have that mindset so deep and ingrained that this stuff isn't even an enticement anymore. And you can actually say, I'm not weak anymore in this. I'm strong, and it's only because of him. You recognize who he is and what he's done and how he's delivered you from all that generational junk from the past. Amen? Amen. And I don't know if you caught this or not, but in praise and worship, I look for themes and words. But it came very strong this morning that he has set our feet on a firm foundation. Amen. 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 Those places where you might feel weak and where the enemy points at all your mistakes and all your things, you're just going to go, Lord, in the midst of this weakness, Lord, be strong. Be strong. Cause the decisions and the commitment that I make today, Lord, to multiply into an habitual routine and the rhythm of the glory of God for my life. You guys get what I'm saying this morning? I mean, I'm speaking to me. I got, I got issues. I got stuff in my life. I identified in ways in my life. Have I overcome in a lot of areas? Yeah, but How many of you know I'm still in process? All of us are, right? Amen. Otherwise, you just need to go to heaven. If you're you're past it all, just go. You're perfected. But it's not time to go yet. And in the midst of that, God uses me right where I'm at. And God will use you right where you're at. Amen. Amen. Just let things begin to die and fall off. Let it go. And stop resurrecting it once it's off. Right. <laughs> Speak healing to that honey bun. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Tom, right?
God wants to set your course. Set your course. If he's wrapping this thing up, you guys, allow God to position yourself, to position you in the right place at the right time for his moments of opportunity. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Father. Bow your heads with me. Father, I just thank you. Thank you, God, for your word today. Lord, we look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, God. Lord, we might have missed it in areas, but Lord, it's not too big for the blood of Christ. God, not only to cover, but just to wash us in the water of the word. Lord, that, that the Lord on high, God, that you would just touch lives today. God, help us to know it's not about our strength, it's about your strength, God, in us. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the spirit of the living God. Thank you, God, for setting the course today. Lord, for fine-tuned adjustments in the lives of your people today, God. Help us, Lord, to look at this at this life that pushed back all of the stuff that was going on. And just said, I'm going to worship him for who he is. Help us to have that hunger and that desire on the inside, God. Times of peace and in times of desperation. Whenever, Lord, that we would come aside and see. see you for who you really are. Thank you for each person that walked through these doors this morning, God. I know, God, that this message is challenging, but at the same time, God, I just thank you, God, for hearts that are going after you, Lord. We want to pursue you, God. We want to ask so that we can receive whatever it is, God, that you're telling us to ask for, that it's in your heartbeat rhythm, Lord, that we're asking to receive. Lord, that we're going to seek and we know we're going to find and we're going to keep on knocking until the doors are opened, God, that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, you love us right where we're at. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this group of believers here today, God. That you would increase in areas of grace. That you would increase in areas of mercy. That you would increase in areas of faith. In the hearts of your people, God. Help us as a ministry of impact, God to impact this generation for you. To take the rightful place that you have for each and every one of us. And that's a favored place. That's a grace place. That's a faith place. That's a merciful place. So God, we can do the things that you've called us to do. Lord, I'm just reminded where you Jesus, you said, greater things are we going to do. Greater things. And I I believe that's on a corporate level, God. All of us moving in sync. The church of the living God moving on the face of the earth. Speaking and moving and acting. Lord, by what you say and what you do. Thank you for that, God. Thank you for your presence today. Lord, we just want to tell you, just take a minute here, guys. Tell him how much you love him. Thank him because he's in your life. Even for some of you, worship. Worship him right where you're at.
Lord, you told us in a time of need to come boldly before your throne of grace. That means that we can ask that you are giving us your divine scepter of approval and acceptance. And God, that we're going to receive in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. That name where demons flee, where deliverance comes, where peace enters into the midst of a storm. fulfiller of everything that we've seen in times of old. He's the fulfiller of the promise. He's the fulfiller of the scriptures. And he's the fulfiller of your life. Chelsea are going to help me this morning pray for people. If anybody needs extra prayer, we're here. If you need to believe God for something great and you, and, and, and you just need somebody to stand with you, come up and get prayed for this morning. Thank you guys for coming today. I know it's Labor Day weekend. There are a lot of other places you could be. But you know what? You decided to show up. How many of you are glad you did? I'm glad I did. I, man, I could have stopped after the praise and worship. Songs that were just hitting my heart this morning. It's all about him. Love you guys.